Hello, I'm Matt Wilhelm, a fifth year PhD candidate at the University of Connecticut, working with Professor Stuber. It's my pleasure to discuss some of the recent work we've done solving optimization problems with embedded dynamical systems. Now, the particular class of optimization algorithm I'll be focusing on today is that of deterministic global optimizers. That is, when these algorithms terminate, they furnish a solution which is known to be the true global optima of the function within specified user tolerances. This approach is particularly useful for many distinct classes of problems. So we have the traditional non-convex formulations, such as the mixing and pooling problem, where we may have a large number of non-convex and non-convex equality constraints in particular for this case, which result in there being many local optima. And by operating this uh, mixing and pooling operation at a global solution, you can achieve some particular economic benefits that may be quite substantial compared to using a local solution for this problem. In other cases, such as the design of safety critical systems, the information you get from a global optimization scheme may be qualitatively better in forming design decisions than local optima. So if I have the mixer and separator system here, wherein I have heated pressurized vessels, well, it's very useful to know what the highest attainable temperature in the system is in terms of information that will help me pick um, materials of construction and also specify safety equipment. Knowing a suboptimal high temperature doesn't necessarily inform my decision the same way when building that. Lastly, there are a number of cases where the configuration of a physical system is defined by some sort of optimization problem. This occurs in thermodynamics where it might be defining equilibrium as a minimum of Gibbs free energy. And we know these systems uh, explore the underlying space so efficiently that we're never actually going to encounter a suboptimal point in any, you know, hundreds of thousands of universe lifetimes. So really the true globally optimal stable solution is what determines the configuration of our system. Now, essentially all these optimizers work on some variation of spatial branch and bound. So essentially you have a stack of nodes which defines the domain of the problem. You pick one of those nodes, you can peel a lower bound, you can peel an upper bound. If your lower bound is worse than a candidate upper bound in some other region, you can discard the region you're currently looking at because you know it's the best possible solution is dominated by a candidate solution in some other region. And you keep partitioning these nodes and you keep competing lower and upper bounds. If you do this with some mild assumptions, eventually you get to a true global optimal value. Now, the focus of this talk will be really how we've done some recent work on integrating ways of constructing relaxations and bounds of dynamic systems into this general global optimization framework. So there are two classes of algorithms that are generally used to construct these types of relaxations of dynamic systems. There's the discretize and relax approach in which you discretize the problem into a finite number of time points. Then you construct relaxation at each of those points in time. And that's what we've done some initial work in this area where we've developed specialized implicit multi-step methods and that in part is motivating some of our interest in these global optimization problems. There's also this other class 
which is generally referred to as this relax then discretize approach, wherein the relaxations of dynamic system are defined by an auxiliary system of differential equations, which you can then just integrate using modern differential equation solution methods. So you can think sundials, you can think OD45S, most sort of algorithms that you can access through differential equations, Jodale would be adequate for solving these types of systems. So to take that dynamic relaxation algorithm and incorporate it into a global optimizer, it enters play mostly in construction of lower bounding problems and in domain reduction. So we need to take our active node, we use this algorithm to compute relaxations of the state variables at a certain number of points. Then we apply a McCormick Othbury arithmetic to compose these relaxations in a way to get the objective functions, relaxations, and the relaxations of constraints needed to solve a lower bounding problem. Generally, we have three main options for this. So we can use that algorithm we've just talked about, and that defines a, a single evaluation of this convex relaxation. And we can solve a convex nonlinear program by repeatedly evaluating these, getting great information, solving linear systems, the whole shebang. We can also take our relaxation by way of few particular points, and since it's convex, we can um, generate certain supporting hyperplanes and use these to define polyhedral relaxations of the convex relaxation solve these via linear program. We can also refine interval bounds because the interval extensions of these supporting planes um, can be used to find valid interval bounds as well. And you can intersect these with natural interval bounds to get something that's necessarily at least as tight and often tighter. And which of these you choose is basically dependent on the problem structure, whether it's um, prone to sort of numerically stable ca intermediate calculations, or also whether um, you can effectively solve a nonlinear program quickly. Because if you can't, maybe it's worth solving a linear program, which is less tight, but solving it much quickly and transversing the branch, branch and bound tree more efficiently. Additionally, for domain reduction, we can solve optimization problems to shrink the domain. So instead of solve, having an objective which reduces, defines this um, minimum of the objective function we're looking at, we can specify that we'd like to instead maximize in the p direction. And if we get a value that's lower, that's smaller than our initial box size, we can infer that there's some uh, infeasible region we can cut off. So to actually use these, we need to be able to query the convex and cave relaxations we've calculated, the subgradient or gradient thereof, interval bounds, and also to infer some status related to the relaxation algorithm. It's possible that in some cases these won't necessarily terminate adequately. So we just need to know that so we can throw it to a different backup routine if necessary. Now, the upper bounding problem is generally much simpler for a global optimization. Essentially, all we really need to do is compute a feasible point. So typically what's done is you solve a nonlinear program to local optimality. Um, in some cases, you'll set up acceptable tolerances and limits in case to limit this from going too far or to spend too much time on a single local NLP solve. And then to do this, you use the same usual toolbox of things you need for solving local, locally uh, nonlinear programs. So that would be evaluating the objective, constraints, gradients, Jacobians, Hessians, possibly some vector products if you want to be efficient about um, storage of and memory consumption. So we tried implementing this in Ego, which is our global solver we've been developing in Julia for quite some time. It's meant to be extensible. 
and we've applied it to a number of fairly exotic optimization formulations with some novel solution methods that we probably couldn't do using off-the-shelf global optimizers that really focus on standard factorable functions. Well, you run into a couple problems when you initially try this. First, you need really highly performing code to evaluate the trajectories of differential equations because we may be evaluating millions of these trajectories to solve these nonlinear optimization problems or the millions of lower bounding problems we may eventually go through. Uh, additionally, um, this may be kind of obvious to some people, but the state variables that are used to define these dynamic problems um, behave differently than the decision variables in typical optimization formulations. That is, they're parameterized by the decision variable usually and time, and that introduces some complexity in how you actually query information relating to these variables. So we've built a couple of these packages which contain various discrete and continuous time approaches for relaxations. We also include this abstraction layer to essentially give us a standardized means of defining problems and querying them that is separate from the core global optimization functionality. We've done this by essentially creating two classes of structures. So there's the abstract relaxation problem, and then there's an abstract integrator. So the relaxation problem holds all the relevant mathematical information you'd need to have a well-posed relaxation constructed via some method. And then to this problem, we can add various information if we're going to use that to refine the relaxations via a get and set functionality. We take this problem, we build the integrator, and we can again set and get various attributes. So what this looks like in Julia is we have this system of parametric differential equations as one example. So this is just a differential equation system where we have some parameter values p. Um, there's an initial condition which in this case we fix to a fixed number of concentration values. And then we know that the connect parameters vary within some predetermined box. So we set this up in many ways like we would a differential equation that we've defined with, say, differential equations.jl, where we have a right-hand side function. We have initial conditions. We have a time span. And then we associate with this, again, a box over which we can actually compute these relaxations and build our relaxation problem. Now, in this particular case, the example was drawn from the chemical kinetic world. And we know that for these types of problems, we can incorporate some additional information to potentially tighten the relaxation we end up getting using our algorithm. So one thing that's useful here is to go back to uh, you know, your high school stoichiometry and realize that in this system, we're not creating a destroying mass. So we can uh, take our chemical equations and make a stoichiometric matrix. And that defines this linear system, which must be satisfied. We also know that the concentrations have to be below some sort of maximal value for typical temperature and pressure in this little liquid vessel. So we can also associate some upper and lower bounds for the state variable, which we know a priori. And we do this, again, using the get set functionality as shown here with some particular attributes. We then build our integrator. In this case, this is a um, relax then discretize approach. We specify a parameter value to evaluate the relaxation at. Then we relax the problem and query attributes. We can do this either using um, essentially integer values to grab the third or fourth, um, or the bounds at the third or fourth point, rather. And we can also specify that we'd like information pertaining to a particular time point via flowing parameter. So what happens at time 0 
Additionally, we can compute, we can integrate the problem at a particular parameter value and not compute a relaxation, but rather get a local trajectory and great information thereof. Uh, we've chosen to associate each of the relaxation algorithms with an integration scheme. Uh, and this is because we want to be able to support relaxation approaches that don't necessarily rigorously account for truncation error. So we can associate a local integrator that has the same truncation error properties and avoid falsely fathoming things in global optimization via that approach. So just to look at how this integrates and with Eco's overall functionality of solving fairly complex script-defined optimization problems. We're going to look at this exothermic polymerization reactor example where we're really considering whether once this reaction is going it hits its peak temperature if a sensor would or fault, would that sensor fault essentially throw us outside the realm of a controllable system at that particular time step. So we can formulate this as a robust operation SIP. Again, it embeds this dynamical system, which is just going to be a mass and energy balance associated with that chemical reacting system. Um, the actual rates, though, get kind of complicated in that you have to solve this nonlinear system of equations to find a quasi steady state. So we've replaced this with a surrogate three layer Gaussian error linear unit feed for neural network to approximate this nonlinear solve. And then when we apply the, a modification to the SIP res algorithm in ego, we can solve this in under a minute. Um, we're fairly excited about extending this approach to other somewhat weird classes of functions that aren't really in the standard global optimization factorable function framework for modeling. So one of which is implicitly defined functions that are defined by some sort of um, nonlinear inequality constraint. Um, neural networks are a great one that we're going to be looking at further in the future. And more recently, there's been some work on bounding distributional properties of continuous random variables, as well as constructing uh, convex cave relaxations of actual black box functions effectively. And we think that this type of approach, because it falls in this generalized McCormick framework, is something we can compose with other types of differential equation solving approaches, Jackson equations, etc., to generate some new theory and approaches. So we're excited about that. We'll also be looking at integrating this further into Ego and extending this to support additional Julia-based um, functionality, such as TaylorModels.jl through wrappers. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank the University of Connecticut National Science Foundation for funding. Thanks. Bye.